All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Oof. Where are we at? Let's try that again, because we're at the City Club. <laughs> good evening, everybody. Good evening. All right. Thank you very much. I'm Felton Thomas. I want to thank Bob for that great introduction. I want to thank the City Club for its 100 year uh, 100 years of civic engagement for the city of Cleveland, soon to be 101, two weeks from now, I understand. So we congratulate the City Club on their, their birthday to soon to come. I wanted to take this time to kiss up a little bit and wish my bosses a happy Bosses Day. <laughs> and uh, acknowledge my, the board of trustees who are here, um, our board president, Tom Corrigan, <laughs> Alan Seifla, Alice Butts, and John Hairston here. I didn't miss anybody, did I? Oh, and Maritza Rodriguez back there. I'm sorry, Maritza. Claire, you were with the whole gang. Give Maritza a good round of applause as well. <laughs> All right, thank you. So, let's get started. The Forest City, metropolis of the Western Reserve, the rock and roll capital of the world, Seatown, The Cleave, Sixth City, America's Comeback City, America's North Coast, The New American City, The Heart of New Connecticut, you didn't quite get that one, The Best Location in the Nation, The Mistake on the Lake. Cleveland has been known by many names throughout its 217 year history, but one of those names is one that you probably haven't heard of. How many people here, and I'll ask if you'd raise your hands, have heard of Cleveland City of Hope? Except for you, and you guys kind of told me, so you don't count. <laughs> what a lot of you may not know is during, um, during times of slavery, Cleveland had a code name, and that code name was Hope. And Slaves who were part of the Underground Railroad were passaged through to Cleveland because Cleveland was that place, if you made it to Cleveland, you would make it to your ultimate goal, which was Canada. So everybody wanted to get to the port of Cleveland so that they could make it across the lake to Canada. Therefore, Cleveland became known as Cleveland, the city of hope. So today, we have many thoughts and we have the opportunity to really see Cleveland as the city of hope. We have so many hopeful things happening within the city. We have investment in our downtown, rebirth of the flats, a focus on local food and top-notch chefs, companies moving their businesses back to the urban core. We have the movement of uh, a momentum on the uh, public square to the malls to the lakefront and the work on that project. We have the mayor and the chief of education, Monica Price, and the CEO, uh, Superintendent uh, Eric Gordon, with a concerted plan on education, the transformation plan. We have a lot of things to be hoped for. And we have a lot of neighborhoods that are creating that hope. Our second downtown, University Circle, Ohio City, Gordon Square, and communities that people don't talk about as often. What's happening in Midtown, which is becoming our biotech haven. And then our central neighborhood. And I want to talk about our Sisters of Charity Foundation who are working, and the sisters that are working in the central neighborhood. And Mr. Jeff Patterson from CMHA, who is inches away from being having $30 million worth of investment to completely revitalize the central neighborhood. My fingers are crossed for you, Jeffrey. There are a lot of things to be hopeful about. Today, this conversation is going to be not about what is a possible dream, you know. We want to talk about how we get to really making Cleveland that city of hope. And I'm going to use the prism of the Cleveland Public Library to look through and discuss this with you. So let me tell you a personal story. Uh, a lot of you who know me know that my wife, Linda, is Chinese. And uh, the day I was married, I received a little advice note, which, you know, I, I didn't really 
understand and, and really kind of situate because it was written in Chinese. So I didn't quite get it. But after I had time to kind of talk to my wife about it and, and then I, I, I was able to realize that it was a popular uh, Chinese proverb. And that proverb was, if there is light in the soul, there will be beauty in the person. If there's beauty in the person, there will be harmony in the house. If there's harmony in the house, there will be order in the nation. If there's order in the nation, there will be peace in the world. And basically that said, and it, what they were saying to me is, do your part. We want you to be a good husband. If you're a good husband, you'll have a good family. If you have a good family, you'll have a good neighborhood. If you have a good neighborhood, you'll have a good city. If you have a good city, you'll have a good country. That's one approach. Hey, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be talking about three approaches, but the first pro approach is do your part. As an organization, as an individual, do your part. For 144 years, the Clinton Public Library has done its part. It's been a beacon of hope for information, for books, for materials for the city of Cleveland. We have evolved into being the third largest public research library in the country. We have over 10 million items in our collection. And we have always pioneered within our profession. A lot of you don't understand that when you come into a library today and just walk to a shelf and are able to take a book off the shelf, that happened and started here at the Cleveland Public Library. Before then, you'd have to go to a librarian who'd be sitting there and you'd have to give her a note and she'd decide if you were trustworthy enough to get a library card. <laughs> and by the looks of you, she would have probably said no to many of you. <laughs> we have over 45 foreign languages in our collection. During times when immigrants were coming to this city, Many cities said, we should only provide information in English because the immigrants must learn how to, must learn English, but we felt differently. We were the first library to hire, one of the first libraries of a big library system to hire a female director, Linda Eastman, in 1918. If you go into our Eastman Garden, it's named after her. While many other library systems across the country were segregated and not providing access for African Americans, we never were segregated as a library system. Everyone was welcome in our library. And those of you who like ebooks, we were the first library system to provide ebooks in the country for our patrons. We have a very storied history, and we've always been a five star library. And when I joined here, we were a five star library, and I knew that we were doing our part. However, as I became more acclimated to the city, and I started joining boards and being involved in the city, I started seeing that there were organizations and people who were doing their part plus. Take, for instance, my friends here over here at the Sisters of Charity Foundation. They do their part plus. As a foundation, you know, they know that they, their, their mission is to help the poor in the communities. But they said, we're going to take the central neighborhood and we're going to put our arms around it and we're going to surround it. We're going to do everything we can to provide all the resources that we can to make that community a better community. They are doing their part plus. When you look at organizations like P6, um, like uh, uh, Third Federal a Company who is working with P16 in Slavic Village, a, a community devastated by the foreclosure process, they are doing their part plus. So I started thinking about that and I started saying, well, you know, as an organization, we're doing our part. We're a fabulous library system, but we want to do our part plus. So I, I remember the, the words of Albert Einstein who said, you can't solve a problem by using the same type of thinking that created it. So we had to think differently. And I want to thank the architect of what we did to think differently, Tim Diamond, who created our strategic plan. In that strategic plan, we said we were going to do a number of things, but the first thing that we were going to do was fight community deficits and be very different than most libraries are. You know, libraries aren't involved in how we can help f folks out of poverty, but we wanted to do our part plus. So I want to share with you an experience I had with a woman who, she sent me a letter, and this woman was 
um, had gone into uh, a temp agency. And she went in the temp agency and she took the test. They had a computer test to see if she would be a viable candidate to, to work with them. And she failed it miserably. And they sent her out and said, we just can't, can't use you. And so as she was walking out, the one of their staff ran behind her and said, you know, you need to go down to Cleveland Public Library and see if they can help you. So she went to one of our libraries. And for three months, staff worked with her, teaching her Word, Excel, all of the office packages, how to do email, little by little, getting her skills better and better. So in three months, she went back, and she passed the exit. And then she went on, and they sent her out on a job. And in three months, she was hired full time there. And so afterwards, she sent me this, this letter. And she just said, you know, there's not much more I can do for you. I really don't have a lot of money to provide you. But I want to send this check of $5 to let you know I appreciate all that you guys do for us in the city of Cleveland. That's doing our part plus. Now, many of you, though, have seen, or no, probably not many of you, I, some of you, and hopefully only a few of you have seen my TED Cleveland speech, where I talk about be, the library becoming a drum major for change. And in that speech, you know, I, I used Dr. King's words, if you want to say that I'm a drum major, say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. Say that I was a drum major for righteousness. And all the other shallow things shall not matter. And when you read that passage further on, what Dr. King was saying is that I don't want to be seen just as someone who's out front. Everybody wants to be the drum major. Everybody wants somebody to take the picture. Everybody wants to be out front and be the one that becomes famous. But if you're going to be a drum major, you better be a drum major for something. And you better have passion around it. And so we started thinking about what did we want to be drum majors for? When I was at the Ted Cleveland speech, we said we want to be drum majors for community change. But we weren't sure of where we wanted to go and what we wanted to be. So this is a call to action for you, because we now know what we want to, want to be. Thanks to a lot of financial support from our friends of Cleveland Public Library, our Overdrive, we know that we are going to be drum majors for early reading, because early reading is essential to this community. Everybody has heard or may have heard about the third grade guarantee that the, the governor has put forward. And people wonder, you know, why? It's because the mayor, the governor has been told time and time again, if a child is not reading at grade level by third grade, he is four times more likely to drop out of school. We know the statistics. They've been done for 20, 25 years. We know early reading is where it is. So we have started three things that we are calling everyone to action on. Number one, I'm ready to read. We want every child to have a library card by the age of five. It's essential that they have a card. And thanks to the help of CMSD, to our friends at uh, Friends of Cleveland, uh, of, of, of Friends of Cleveland Public Library, we sent library cards out to every student, every kindergarten student in the city of Cleveland this past September. Two, you all need to read more. <laughs> it's not only an I'm ready to read for kids, it's an I'm ready to read for adults. Statistics just in a study last month said that adults dropped a percentage in their number who read for leisure. We're reading less as adults, and wouldn't we imagine that our young people who see us as role models will then read less themselves? And three, we're working on creating a reading summit, a way that we all can pull together, my friend Stan Miller over there, pull together everybody, to start having a conversation about how we promote the city of Cleveland as a community that reads. Reading is going to be our call to action. It's going to be what we get in, out in front of and be the drum major for. But I want to end with one final story, because none of this matters unless 
we recognize that being the city of hope takes a lot more than dreams. So uh, Pastor Troy Davidson, like at uh, Antioch Baptist Church, tells the story of this boy. So this boy is sleeping, and he's having this, this beautiful dream. In this dream, he's walking down this garden, this beautiful green grass, and he's on it, and he looks over to the side, and there's these beautiful red roses, and then these lilies on the one side, and he, he's just so, so much in peace, and he keeps walking, and he gets to the end, and all of a sudden, this big, gigantic, golden lion jumps out at him. And this lion is huge. He, he just, you know, is twice the size of the boy. And the lion just starts getting ready to front, and he gnashes his teeth. And the boy just kind of falls back, and he says, are you going to eat me? And the lion just stops and says, I don't know. It's your dream. <laughs> <laughs> Cleveland being the city of hope is our dream. We have to make it happen. The library is going to do our part. Are you guys going to do your part? Are you going to do your part plus? Are you going to be drum majors? That's up to you. We know what we're going to do, and we hope you join us. Thank you. So we're going to have time for the traditional City Club uh, question and, and answer from the audience in, the, in a few moments, but we're going to start with a little conversation first. Mm -hmm. So you and I were talking a few days ago in, in advance of this conversation. And you talk about doing your part plus. And I think the plus it could always be sometimes collaboration. Uh -huh. A library can just be a library, but how, you, how do you collaborate with others? Could you elaborate more on how you collaborate with the school district? You know, um, surprisingly enough, this, collaborating with the school district has not been, is, is not a, um, a thing that happens just normally with libraries. It's across the country, libraries and school districts don't generally have good relationships. It's, it's an odd thing. You don't understand why, um, but you don't. And so it, it has to be worked through. Uh, I'm very, very thankful for Eric Gordon and his support and his willingness to, to do things like our ability of, of working with us to be able to send library cards out to every kindergarten student. That's something new that we wanted to do that we haven't had an opportunity to find a way to reach into the, to the students at their homes. And thanks to his help, we were able, able to do something like that. Those are collaborations that I think will have long-term effect. If we hit every kindergartner along the way, eventually we're going to get to seniors who all have had their library cards through us and who are working mm -hmm. within the school district to be partners with us. So you, Clevelanders have a, a history of being very generous. Yes. And you know, we've placed a lot of uh, investment in the schools. Mm -hmm. just the past year or so. And uh, issue 79 is coming up right now. I yeah. see a button here. I see a bunch of buttons in the crowd. So to make sure I get some of the, the, uh, the points right, it's a, it's a five-year library renewal. True. Which has been, on, uh -huh. been in place for quite some time. So it's not a tax increase. Not a tax increase. Okay. And it's 48% of your operating budget. It is. You said it just like I told you. <laughs> <laughs> and as a Cleveland resident, I will be voting for it. So I'll give you that right Thank there. Thank you there, Bob. Um, how important is that to continue all of the initiatives that you just talked about and in reaching the vision of the library? I mean, it's, it's, it's vital. I mean, it, it's our, the dream, the City of Hope can't help, can't happen for us if we don't have the funding to do it. it I mean, it, it just comes down to that. I mean, um, we have already had to make major cuts. I mean, over the five years since I, I came in 2008, or at the end of 2008, we've reduced our, our uh, budget by nearly 20 percent and you know we've been able to figure out ways to make things happen but you can't do that and lose half of your budget you just right. aren't able to do it we'll just be holding on and any organization that just holds on doesn't have the priorities of the community at heart All right so uh, we we're also talking about this past week and a lot of people have been maybe attending functions at the convention center recently mm -hmm. So I found myself traveling between the warehouse district to the convention center quite a bit and using a very nice park, that the, the, the reading area that you have there, uh, as that cut through. So I'm curious, how does the library tie into the group plan conversation that's underway and can connect what's traditionally been kind of the backside of the building yeah. to now what's really the downtown's uh, front yard? It, it is difficult. I'm on the group plan commission, and 
as we look at it, the, one of the things that the, from public square to the malls, on the malls, all the buildings on the malls don't face the mall. They all face, they're all, they have their backs to the mall. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at it, why no one ever went out there was because everybody was facing somewhere else. We're facing Superior, the school district was facing, you know, 6th Street and, and, and whatever. So it, it wasn't a, a situation in, in which you were, they were getting folks out there. And so we've been thinking about how can we be more involved. And so you're starting to see it with the artwork, like the reading nest. How many people had the opportunity to see the reading nest out there? It's a, it's a fabulous, fabulous piece of art that draws people there, that allows our reading garden to be the entrance to the library. It's our back door and, and that. I, I'm, I'm happy you brought up some of the thoughts that we're looking at on how we're going to do that. We want to be a downtown destination. We believe, you know, people are surprised that when, you know, you have that trip advisor that said, this is the number sixth place visited in the city, that the Cleveland Public Library is always in the top 10 of, of places people visit when they come to Cleveland and they write great reviews about it. And people are always shocked about that, but I, I, I'm not because the Cleveland Public Library, our main building, is a, is, is a wonderful place to come and visit. Even more bit wonderful because of the work of you know, Boswick Design, who's, who's working on our building, Robert Boswick's here, who's doing work and the, they've done a tech central in our building that is just fabulous, just drawing lots of people. We have a, 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 a development plan, our five phases that we're working on to make our building a destination by the time public square is in place. Yeah, so a piece of that is outreach and people need to know that how they can mm -hmm. touch the library and feel the library. And if you're not a regular library user, you probably won't stumble upon it until you literally stumble upon it. So uh, can you talk more about the outreach efforts? You look at the book kiosk in Ohio City. Yeah. And I think that's been a, a huge success. Well, we've gotten a lot better at that. I mean, libraries are, are naturally people who toot their horn very, very well. And, you know, and, you know, there's a thing about the stereotype, but there is a little bit of truth to the stereotype. We just like getting things done. You want to get things done, give it to a librarian. No one will know it was done, but it'll be done. <laughs> so we, we know that we have to get better. And you know, we're doing a lot of, of partnering with folks to make sure that we get the word out. And we're getting out and doing outreach because you know, uh, whether it's you know, what we do at um, a West Side Market or what we do at Case or Tri-C or um, at Cleveland State by having outreach buildings there. It's, it's all about how can we get more out, how can we get out into the community and let the community know about what we're doing. And we do that on a, on a daily basis. We're, and it doesn't get a lot of exposure. You don't find a lot of things written about us. Um, but you see us out there in the community and the community knows we're out there. So I'm gonna give you the platform to toot your own horn. What all are right. some of the things about the library that you wish more people knew? Chess was something you and I talked about. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the one thing, and, and, and I say this a lot, and I, and I still haven't said it enough, uh, people don't know that we have the largest collection of materials on chess in the world, not just in the United States, in the world. Um, so, and, and checkers. And if you ever want to see the World Chess Championship, che uh, World Checker Championship held every year at the Cleveland Public Library, it's fascinating. Um, that's, that's the number one. That's, we have some of the best collection of materials in the world. That's the third largest research library. You can come in there and spend months just going through our collections and finding different things that, that, that are just amaze you about what we do. Now, I'll, I'll give you a, a fun one. We have a collection of Cleveland and some of the private schools and, and, and uh, parochial schools of their yearbooks back to 1895. So if you ever want to blackmail somebody, a friend of yours, with, with pictures of them in high school, you can go to the Cleveland Public Library's website and go online and see all of the yearbooks for various people. That is the number one thing that people come to our website to find. And it's, and it's just one of those secret things that no one knows about us. But we find ways to make you entertained. <laughs> Is that going to be the new tagline? I like it. <laughs> <laughs> the People's University transforming to the People's University. You know, we find ways to entertain you. You know, I am from Vegas, so. Yeah. <laughs> 
So on that, this is the we were just talking about this in the the pre the pre conversation that I grew up in Vegas, did a little college in, in Hawaii as well. Mm -hmm. I, I joke this is the first time you're living in the real world. So welcome. <laughs> welcome. Uh, it's the first time you're living in a city with sports teams. That's true. So how has that been interesting to you know first time you can enjoy a sporting event and the passion and. Woo. The misery that goes along with the, the being Woo. a part of that. I, in my speech, I actually had a line that said, Cleveland City of Hope, except for past, but, uh, except for Sunday. <laughs> you know, I, I decided I'd cut that out. But, um, you know, it, it is, it's fascinating. I, you know, just being honest and sincere with you, I always find it as someone who never had teams to actually root for, in fact, the city who has three great teams to root for, even though sometimes they don't do as well, are so upset with these, these teams, not recognizing what, what, how lucky they are to have these teams and teams to root for. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I was, you know, uh, telling somebody earlier, I, I want to create the militant middle. And you just go on to, like, uh, websites where everybody's being negative and we just swamp them with positive things, saying everything good about them. I love Whedon. I love him over and over again until they stop doing it. You know. So I mean, there's just so much negativity at times that we have to find ways to 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 be much more positive as a city about things. And and that city of hope idea we recognize, and I think underlying, uh, you know, I'm not being Pollyanna about it. We recognize that there is a need for us all. To, you know, for the city to become much more positive about the city. There's just so many great things happening that we all have to find a way to, to, to talk to people and, and to say, check the negative. We're not having it today. So if I look at the comment section on cleaner.com and I see a change in tone, I can, I'll attribute that to you. That, that, that could be. I was going to say something about it. We have a couple of cleveland.com folks here. I was going to say something earlier and I, I changed it mid squeam you know. I'll take the blame on that one. That's fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> read it every day, though. So, I'm sure there's librarian conferences, and they're probably a really wild time. They are. As you go to these conferences, you talk to your peers from around uh -huh. the, the country and the world. What's something that you've seen in other libraries or systems that you'd like to bring back to Cleveland, uh, just haven't done that yet? Well, I, I think right now is a really interesting time in libraries. Before, it was, uh, I mean, if you're competitive, <laughs> like I am, you always want to beat the other libraries. Um, there were about 10 library systems really doing innovative things. Now everybody is doing any, something innovative. So I'm sitting in my office, and one of my staff members, Anastasia, comes in and just said, Boston Public Library is at the Museum of Art at Gallery One, and they're tweeting right now. What are they doing here? And I said, yeah, what are they doing here? But everybody is all, they're all, everybody's out there trying to find how do we take something and create something innovative within our library system, something very, very different. And so I'll, I'll give you an example of something that I saw, and I just saw it today, that I just thought was, was great. Um, the Harford, uh, Connecticut library system, they have um, a lot of immigrants in their city and they become a, a BIA, I'm not quite sure what that means. They actually became accredited to give uh, help to immigrants so that they can become citizens. So they're accredited by the federal government as a library so that they can help. That's doing your part plus. That's saying we're going to do something completely different that's important for the community. Thank you. So we're going to have a few mid-forum announcements. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we're listening to a special program featuring Felton Thomas, the director of the Cleveland Public Library System. We will return to our speaker momentarily for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We encourage you to formulate questions for our speaker now and remind you that your questions should be brief and to the point. Today we welcome guests to tables hosted by the Friends of the Cleveland Public Library, Sisters of the Charity Foundation, Strate Strategy Design Partners, and Urban Community School. Thank you guys for your support. This Friday, the City Club will host a panel discussion about the government shutdown, although that might have just changed, the vote to raise the debt ceiling and General Washington gridlock with former Representative Steve LaTourette, Professor David Cohen, and NPR Washington correspondent Tamara Keith. For more information about our upcoming forums or to make a reservation to order a CD or DVD of today's program, please refer to our website, cityclub.org. 
Now we'd like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphone today is Program Director Carrie Miller. First question, please. Nobody wants to go. I'll go first. All right. Um, I recently heard a story of um, Tony Shea in Las mm -hmm. Vegas, the CEO of Zappos, who has really transformed that his community by bringing in a lot of cultural institutions and really just building community with the people in, in that neighborhood. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how we can really connect the cultural institutions that we have here and, and really develop a strong community of culture and what the role of the, of the library would be in that type of community. Well, I think it's funny uh, that, that you mentioned Vegas because uh, the, the Vegas libraries are working with Tony Shea on some projects there. And the, uh, the, the libraries there created all their buildings with cultural centers within them and theaters within them because um, in Vegas there's not a lot of that there when, um, uh, in the neighborhoods. We're very fortunate here in Cleveland in that there are there's a lot of cultural institutions in the city. Unfortunately, when I first came here, I don't think they were working very closely together, but I've seen that change. I, I think really the, 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 you know, the, the word has gone out. You collaborate or you will die. And I think we started to see that. And so as a library, I think one of the ways we've been working with everyone is, for instance, we, we do a checkout system for the uh, Museum of Natural History so that if you want to pass to go to the Museum of Natural History, our young people can come into our libraries and they can check out uh, four passes for their family to be able to go to the, to the Museum of Natural History. Those are ways that we're able to find ways of connecting in the neighborhoods and giving people access to our cultural institutions. So I have a question about the systems in general. Uh -huh. The Cleveland Public Library, I live in the city, so it's, I guess, my home library, if mm -hmm. you will. I also in Cuyahoga County. We have a Cuyahoga County library yeah. system. I grew up in a suburb that has its own little fiefdom library as well. So I wouldn't well, necessarily call it a fiefdom. Well, I, could, I grew up there, I can say that, right? Okay, so yeah, you yeah, did, yeah, yeah, you can. Um, I'm curious how those conversations, are there conversations on, I know you collaborate uh -huh. quite a bit. Yes. Um, but, you know, how do these system, different systems come about and with the budget challenges that you've talked about, are there other conversations going on about even more streamlining operations? You know, when I came here, one of the first discussions everybody said is you're going to have, you're going to get a lot of questions about whether there should just be one library system in this county. Currently, there are nine library systems, and, and people are, are kind of shocked by that when I say nine library systems, really, that, that sounds like too much. And then I said, well, there's 57 police departments, you know, or 57 mayors, or 57 everything else. So, I, you know, I, I, I don't think nine is, is that awful much. But I think, you know, what communities have done is they really like the, the library systems, and the communities like the library systems we have. They support them. They financially support them because I think they believe that the library systems understand the communities they serve. And typically, you know, if you're a library system that, that really can't support your community or provide a community, then you're open for consolidation. You know, but mm -hmm. if not, if people really like what you do and they like the way you provide your library services, they want you to continue to do that. Uh, once the issue 79 passes, uh, and you don't have to worry about that funding challenge. Uh, what should we look for for launching your initiative for reading literacy that you mentioned? And are there any obstacles that you see uh, for having that uh, really be uh, a program that's welcomed by the community? Well, um, you know, our first plan as soon as the levy passes, and thank you for being positive, is it, uh, we really have what we call our step plan. You know, we know that. We have lots of kids coming into our libraries and our community wants to make sure that we are a safe place for them and especially safe online, so we'll be doing work there. Uh, we'll be increasing our technology, working on our education, taking our 10 homework help centers to make homework help centers in all our library. But to your point, our next phase of what we're going to do is going to center around the last uh, piece of our step, which is preservation. 
And it's an exciting project that we're going to be working on creating uh, the digital hub in our library system where folks could come down and we'll, or we're going to, we have a grant that's in right now and looks good coming in in which we'll get these four gigantic scanners. And the idea is we train people on how to scan all their materials and uh, your genealogy, all your materials that you want, you'll be able to come in and scan that and hold on to it in a way that you know you can keep your own history and you can create your own history for it. It's going to be called the Digital Hub and actually you will help create it. So thank you for that question. <laughs> Felton Thomas, thank you for sharing another vision. I uh, just want to share a quick note. Uh, several weeks ago I started volunteering as a reader to a third grade class in a CMSD school. The first day I got there, this third grade class, they all looked uh, very bright and vibrant. Uh, talked to them about the importance of reading uh, and then I made a reference that uh, when I get home I read with my kids. A third grader raised her hand she said you mean you read at home too? And that was just shocking that yeah. kind of just stuck with me so it kind of underscores the importance that we as a community need to embrace reading uh, and, and that message needs to go all over the place and even in the homes. Uh, so how can volunteers be engaged with the libraries to promote reading? Uh, um Thank you for that question, Ken. You know, I think it's, it's, it's tremendously important that we, we recognize that many of the children are not reading at home, that we have to engage them in many different places to inspire them to love reading. One, a, a recent study that was done in, in the United Kingdom that came out found that kids 10 to 16 that were, um, that, that read, frequently did much better than the other kids who, in reading, math, and whatever, but what was the most important piece of that was it didn't matter the education level of the parents. So even kids who were poor and their parents didn't have a lot of means, if they read, they were scoring at the same level at those parents who had people who had, who had parents who were PhDs who didn't um, who had kids who weren't reading well, who weren't reading a lot. And that's an important, you know, uh, research piece that I, I think that, to say, if we can get every, all these young people to, to, to ins uh, inspire them to have a love of reading, that love of reading is going to take them a very far away in their life. Um, and it's going, to, it's going to make them a lot more likely to succeed. And, uh, you know, at the core, that's what we have to do. We, we sort of glossed over the Cleveland sports scene because of <laughs> cur current situations. But would you talk a little bit about the, the library's uh, uh, sports arc, uh, research center, uh, the reasons for it, and, and what you can find there? We, we do. And, and one of the things, I mean, and, and I was talking about just collections in general and how we have some tremendous uh, uh, collections. We have a collection of uh, the Robert Mears collection of baseball cards and memorabilia within our, within our collection. And we created a sports research center in our library for those folks because the city loves sports. So we have a collection of, of, of unbelievable photographs with, uh, uh, dealing with sports. We have a variety of collectibles and, and a lot of sports memorabilia, meaning uh, cards and things of that nature, going back to the early 1880s in the city of Cleveland. And, and, and with that, um, it's just fascinating when you come down and you're able to see all of the this Indians and Browns and, and uh, uh, Cavs history because really you see a transition in all of these different sports. And, and then not only in those sports, there's all of these other things that were happening throughout the city that the sports that the city's had in its history that you, and for me, who's been, been here just five years, you have no clue that that was even there. I mean, and I can't even start to think of some of the other sports that were here. Oh yeah, the boxing tradition in this city, you know? And, and, and some of the history around that, and we have that, all that in our sports research center. So, I mean, if you're a sports historian or somebody who's very into sports with the city of Cleveland and want to find out more about it, 
you know, the Clinton Public Library is a fabulous place to go and just spend some time and go through the Sports Research Center that has, you know, just a tremendous amount of, of information to provide. Dalton, you mentioned uh, the neighborhoods and a lot of the change. And certainly in four or five years since you've been here, a lot has changed yeah. in, cer in certain neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. and you, thank you for mentioning Midtown. Our business has been there for many years, and certainly a lot of interesting things going on in that, that area, too. How is that changing how the system looks and, and treats the neighborhoods, and how is it also affecting the, the, the local branch that's in that neighborhood? Well, I think what we're finding is, and what we're trying to do is see how we can be, uh, um, be more helpful to what the, that neighborhood needs. And so as we have, and, and let's take um, the Slavic Village neighborhood and the, the Fleet Library that serves that neighborhood. That neighborhood is a neighborhood that has had to change a great deal because of the foreclosure uh, situation there. And so as a, as a community library, we've had to figure out how do we serve this community? The community is very, very different than it was before. And so, you know, one of the things that we are looking at for our future is, are we going to, you know, change hours for each branch? You know, some places, you know, at, with our fleet library, that's the neighborhood that a lot of those, the folks are, are out and, and working during the day, and we've got to figure out how do we serve it. And it, many of the children have moved out of the neighborhood. So how do we, we, we work with what the community needs as compared to like a central neighborhood that has just, is just overloaded with children. And yet we have a branch that was built for adults. How do we, we do that? And so we have been evolving as an organization to be how do we serve each community in what it needs separately. And that's, that's different for libraries to do. Library one, you know, it's easy to, be one box and take that box and make it at 27 times um, and try to be 27 different boxes is not very easy to do. Uh, Mr. Director, you spoke about um, having a reduction in revenue of about 20% over the last couple of years. Um, most of the public has not seen a, redu a reduction in, in services, customer service. Uh, how were you able to attain that at the same time you had to take the hit that you've been hit? Uh, you, that you inherited uh, and had to deal with over the past couple of years? It's, it's really been about a change in priorities. And I have to give it to our staff. The staff is really who, who made this happen. I mean, our, comparably over the five years while we've seen the, you know, our funding go down, actually our statistics have gone up. We're busier than ever. Two of the past five years have been the busiest the Cleveland Public Library has been in 50 years. And so, we have had to figure out how we're going to provide the services that need and, and prioritize that. And one great example is technology. Um, we, when I first came on, we had about 250 computers in the, in the library system. And we go everywhere and there'd be lines of folks that would be waiting. We said, we've, we've got to change this because most of the, the community um, doesn't have access to internet at home and the kids don't have internet access. We've got to find a way to be able to, to provide access for them. And so we doubled the number of computers that, that are available to them. Now, I've got to tell you this story because, it, very much like Ken's story, we, we had an, a, a, a little uh, summer reading awards thing at one of our branches, our Huff branch. And we gave the winner one this little I, iPod. And we gave the iPod to the young man, and the iPod, the young man said, what is this? And we said, this is an iPod. And he goes, what does it do? You know, and, and, and it, it was, I mean, it was something that we're surprised by because we just assume all these kids have or see this or at least see it on TV or know what it does or whatever. And he was 11. He really, he had no clue to what it was used for. And, and that said to me, the kids are starving for us to provide them with the technology and the access to technology so they can be on par with every kid in whatever suburb around the city. And so that's what we've done. Um, we have petting, uh, a technology petting zoo 
that goes around to different libraries. The kids are able to see all these different gadgets and gizmos. And in our main library, we have a permanent one. And, and that's the idea. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's about, you know, the, the future is about what we're going to do to prioritize what makes the most sense. Now, to Trustee Harrison, to what you were also saying about that is, while we prioritize and being successful at prior, that priority, it's created cracks that we haven't been able to really do within the organization. We're not open on Sundays any longer, which is hard for young people who are trying to get in the libraries and, and do that work on the Sundays. Those are, are difficult decisions that we had to make. And you know, we're hoping at some point in time to be able to have the funding to, to reshape what the library can be for everyone. How are you, Felton? Good job. Uh, I'm not sure many people are aware of your history as a, as a famous drummer in a band in the past, and, and we, you, you don't have to talk about that. But I am interested in how music is to Did some extent. Did you say a famous band on yeah, top yeah. of that? <laughs> famous drummer, perhaps, oh, okay. uh, in a band. But I'm not, I'm not sure uh, everyone realizes what you've brought your passion for music, I think, to the library to some extent through uh -huh. the MyTunes program and partnerships with the Rock Hall. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that as well. Well, yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're, we're very lucky in the city to have so many outlets as far as music go. Um, I, I mean, you know, I, I played drums when I was younger and, and very fortunate to, to, to uh, you know, to understand the importance of, that music can play in someone's life. And so what we have tried to do is find a way how we can marry some of these other art forms to libraries and, and, and to, to reading. So one of the programs we're very, very proud of is a program that we have with the Music Settlement that we go to preschools and we created a literature program that also goes with music. And so we'll have one of our, our library staff and in a Music Settlement teacher and they'll play music and the kids will, will, will say words and colors and things of that nature at the same time. Attaching that learning of the music to the learning and the reading. And finally, when the program is done, the kids have learned the song, the words going along with the music that they play. And, and it's, been a, it's been a really uh, fascinating thing. It's fascinating to see the kids do it. Um, it, it it's, you see a three-year-old being able to dance, tap their hands, do, do some form of song, play some form of instrument, and then you know, read these, this, this word. And it, it, it works. So right now, we're working on actually doing the research to find out you know, along the line when the kids hit five and they hit kindergarten, will their crawl, score, crawl scores be higher because of this, of this, of this work? She won't let go. <laughs> Carrie's not going to let it go. Well, <laughs> I guess I have two comments to make. Uh, one is I've always had a dry sense of humor uh, that many people uh, could not understand, but uh, so do I. I <laughs> but I served. Um, well, I was. I'm a retired Cleveland Public School administrator, and after retiring, uh, taught at John Carroll University for 16 years in the Department of Education. And I was always uh, amazed that uh, the students who were uh, adult students, their poor writing skills, and uh, lack of uh, being able to spell. And I'm saying that to uh, really underscore the importance of young people not only uh, being able to spell, but being able to read. You cannot replace reading. And I know that a lot of uh, young adults uh, do a lot of texting, and one of my most vigorous arguments is that they are not going to be able to spell. And I've had many discussions uh, to defend my stance on that. And the, my sense of humor comes with the commercial that comes on television. And there is a, a farmer, and uh, the question is, how do you spell cow? <laughs> and I think it's so funny. <laughs> and, and he says, C-O-W, 
E I E I O. <laughs> I think that that really sums up <laughs> the major gap in to link reading and spelling. But my more serious uh, comment to you, uh, uh, Felton uh, Thomas, director, is that I know you are very creative, and I'm proud of you as well as the staff at the Cleveland Public Library and its board. But I know that you have a very creative mind. And with the new um, uh, con uh, convention center and the medical center uh, really at your doorstep, I'm thinking that that is a very good opportunity for there to be some collaboration and partnering with those major facilities as far as the kinds of programs uh, and the materials that might be needed for those many visitors who will be coming to the downtown area and they're right at the library's doorsteps. I think she was listening to our phone. I know, me and Bob were just talking about it. Let me introduce Ms. Benarine Branham to you, the honorary boss for me, uh, former board member. Uh, me and Bob were just talking about that. I, I want to say something to the spelling thing to it. I, I, I have two teenage daughters, um, 16 and 13. Fabulous young ladies, smart, bright, whatever. Get them without spell check though, they're in absolute <laughs> trouble. You know, and, 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 and it's not just texting, but it's also all the technology that is now available to them. They have grown up with spell check. They never have to actually go and try to remember something. If it's, red, if it's marked red, it's spelled wrong. Now I need to fix it, you know? Other than that, they don't know if it's spelled wrong or not. Mm -hmm. So, but going to, to your second point, uh, Bob is, uh, and I were talking about this, how do we take advantage of the fact that at our back door we have, you know, the global health Something in innovative. Global center. center for health and innovation. Yeah, something. I, 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 I am, you know, I, somewhere somebody's going to kill me for that because I am on the group plan committee and I, I, I commission, I should know that more than anyone. So I always just go with the, yeah, the former med, you know, medical part, the, the group formerly known as Prince, but uh, <laughs> they, uh, it is, it is a group that we, we have to find a way, and Bob is going to help me do this. We're going to shame people into allowing us inside to say that the Cleveland Public Library can, if we can find a way to open up our own new book box inside that space and say, instead of this little Starbucks cart that they're going to pay you, allow the library to come in and have a space in there where we can feature what the city is about. So. Yeah, that's exactly it. And, and, and then and that will help and push folks also to come and visit us. But, you know, we recognize that for a, a lot of these folks, they really want, uh, while they're there, to be able to, to do some things um, that a, a library can provide. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Felton, for your time. Tonight's uh, special program is concluded. <laughs>